Hi, everybody. I am uh, going to be speaking on Genesis 3. I'm titling this talk, The Fall. What happened in Eden didn't stay in Eden. <laughs> so, um, first thing, though, that I'd like to do is to ask you guys to help me out here. Will you take a moment and bring to mind a relationship in your life right now that is not as it should be? Something that's wrong, a relationship that's not fitting, not working. What is the importance of this relationship in your life? What went wrong between you and this other person? Did you get hurt? Were they hurt? What are you doing about it, about this relationship that's broken or just difficult or troubled? Keep that in mind as I continue to share, and I'll refer back to it along the way. So the fall is what I'm talking about. This is a term used to describe the events in Genesis 3. Um, this is what happens uh, after Adam and Eve's sin. That's the moment of the fall. We live in the effects of the fall every single day, every moment. It's, it's so ubiquitous in our lives that it's like water to fish. We may not even be aware of how much the fall has affected us. So I'm gonna focus specifically on how it affects our relationships. Our relationships with ourselves, our relationship with uh, creation, our relationship with others, and of course, our relationship with God. So we're gonna look at it all through a relational lens. Now, um, last week you heard about Genesis 1 and 2, so you saw what things were like then, how perfect everything was. Think about how our relationship were for Adam and Eve and everything in their lives in the Garden of Eden. Unlike it being terribly hot here today and uncomfortable, <laughs> it was perfect, everything was perfect there. Their food, um, their surroundings, their work, their freedom, their identity, their relationship with creation, with one another, and with God were all perfect. Perfectly matched, perfectly suited. They were free and open. Genesis 2 ends by saying, and they were naked and they were not ashamed. Now, it's easy to think, okay, that's kind of a, a concept of innocence, like when children run around being naked, but think about what that means in relationship. To be naked, what, what that, implies is that they could be fully seen and fully known and not have any problem with that, feel completely accepted and free. That's what things were like before the fall, when all was right with the world. This is a painting by Bruegel, didn't quite blow up as nice as I wanted it to. This is, them, this is him trying to capture the beauty of Eden. And you'll notice way back in the corner is Adam and Eve. Everything is in perfect relational order. Everything is beautiful, everything is right, everything is good, as God said, everything is very good. So what went wrong? By the way, I'm using classic art along the way to help us capture the story in our imaginations of what happened. What went wrong? Well, the serpent, he, wanted Eve to become dissatisfied with her relationship with God. If he could sow this concept of dissatisfaction, perhaps there could be some traction here. We could move the relational order and mess it up. So he asks her, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Think about what that sentence, that question is asking of God. Here, you just saw how beautiful just an artist's depiction of Eden was. And the serpent asks, did God tell you you couldn't like take or partake of any of this beauty? Brings up a question of God's character. He's asking, is God being this way to you in relationship? Now of course not, God is not. And Eve answers, Eve answers, well no, he's not. He didn't say we could eat of, without, out of every tree, but there's one tree we can't eat of. So instead of saying, no, that's not the God I know, he would never do that, she just reduces the scope of his question. 
while he is keeping us away from one tree, suddenly there's a little bit of doubt sown. And the serpent continues to twist the truth when she says, we can't even touch it or we'll die. Which isn't quite what God said. But the serpent tells a half lie. You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. There's truth in what he's saying. She will know good and evil if she takes from the tree, but she'll only know it because she will understand what evil is. The serpent wants Eve to question God's trustworthiness. This is a question of, um, ah, something has happened with my slides here. This is a question of God's goodness. This is a question of relationship. Who is God? Is God worth trusting? Is he withholding from you? Is he keeping something from you that would be better if you tried something else than what he desires? Have you ever thought that maybe sin was actually about relationship more than anything else? So here's an interesting question. By the way, at this moment, the serpent has put this doubt about God, this wondering about God into her mind, but she hasn't sinned yet. I want you to hear that. She hasn't sinned even while she's wondering about God's character. And she's not sure of who God is at this point. She's questioning. That is not a sin. It's what she does with it that's concerning. So if you find yourself with doubts or questions about God, that's not a sin. It's what you do with it that makes a difference. Here's what Eve could have done with her questions. She could have taken counsel in her own heart about what she already knew God to be like. She could have said, you know, the serpent says that he's being withholding from me, but God has given me all this stuff. That isn't quite jibe with who I know God to be. She could have talked to Adam about it. She could have walked up to Adam and said, hey, Adam, the serpent just told me this stuff about God. Is that true? What do you think? She could have even talked to God about it, couldn't she have? She could have said, hey, God, when when he comes walking in the cool of the day, hey God, the serpent just told me some things. Is this true? She could have done any combination of these things. And if she had, these choices would have demonstrated that she valued her relationship with God the way that it was, the way that God set it up. But instead, what did Eve do? She went to the tree. She went to the very nature of the temptation itself to check out whether it lined up with what the serpent had told her about God. And when she saw that it was good for food, check, that's what he had said. When he saw that it was a delight to the eyes, check. These are all things that the serpent said. Wow, he gave her the idea that this was, this was something worth eating. And here's the kicker, and when the tree what was to be desired to make one wise. Ah, then she took of its fruit and ate. Here's the sin. She acted to alter the state of her relationship with God. She didn't want her relationship with God the way that it was. She thought, maybe I can change this. Because remember, the serpent said, you could be like God. She could become wise. She wouldn't have to depend on God and ask God these questions and ask Adam. She chose to eat of the fruit. You see, catching now how this sin was a relational issue? Okay, how about what Adam did or didn't? And the very next thing it says in the text is, and she gave some, she also gave some to her husband. Emphasis mine, who was with her? It's almost a shock to read the text if you're really reading it. He was standing there. (laughs) He was with her when she takes the fruit. And then he ate. So what did Adam do? Nothing. He was completely passive. He 
chose not to do anything, anything in that moment. He just let whatever was gonna happen, happen. He didn't say, hey, wait, Eve, that's the tree we're not supposed to eat of. Hey, Eve, I don't think that would be good for you, or I don't think, that that, I don't think God would be very happy with this. He says nothing. So let me ask you a question. What do you do in relationship when you are tempted to sin, when you personally have a temptation to sin? What do you do? Do you reflect in your own heart about what you know of God? Do you talk with somebody who knows more about God? Like a spiritual director, a pastor, a friend? Do you talk with God himself about what this temptation says about your relationship with him? What are you trying to do outside of your relationship with him? You could do it through scripture and prayer. Or, or, do you go toward the temptation and check it out? Or do you remain completely passive like Adam and just let what's gonna happen happen? And if so, what are you valuing? What is more important to you at that moment than your relationship with God? Just something to think about. I think this is one of the things that 12-step programs try and do when people are, have addictions is they try to make relationship more important than the temptation. Okay, so with one bite, the perfect relational order begins to break down. The way that God had set up everything in creation, God, man, creation, relationship with one another, relationship with God. First thing happens is they're broken within themselves. They eat of the fruit, and then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were suddenly naked. I was trying to go through classic art to find the perfect example of this, and I came up with this. <laughs> it's from a book called Stick by Jeffrey Metzner, where he writes all these, draws all these wonderful images in stick figure. But look at that, it's perfect, right? They're shocked, they're covering themselves. <gasps> what just happened? So what they do is then they take the fig leaves and they cover themselves. What does this mean relationally? Remember, they were naked and unashamed. Suddenly they feel shame about themselves. What was exposed to the world, their most vulnerable parts of themselves, not just physically, but personally, suddenly now they feel they shouldn't be seen. They cover up and they suddenly turn their focus inward. They're no longer focused out and toward others, they're focused on themselves. First breakdown, they become disconnected in their relationship with themselves. Next breakdown, and then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Here comes God. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Isn't that tragic looking? In their guilt and fear, they tried to separate themselves from their relationship with God. Their creator, their sustainer, the one who loved them. They needed to stay away from God. Relational breakdown. But this is what's so, you know, so often I think God gets a bum rap, particularly in the book of Genesis. We give him such a hard time um, in the Old Testament and in Genesis. We think he's, you know, oh, we, we think that like in this moment, if you know the story, that he's like the parent coming to shake his fist at, finger at you and to punish you. But look, just look what God does in this moment. He knows, he's God, he knows what happened, right? He reaches out to them in relationship. He doesn't smite them suddenly. He doesn't call from on high and thunderclap and say, that's it, starting over, right? He could have done all these things, but he comes to them. He comes to them in relationship, in a form that they could relate with, walking in the cool of the day. He calls Adam by name, Adam. And then he asks Adam a gentle, 
powerfully orienting question. I call this the first spiritual direction question. Where are you? Does God need to know where Adam is? I love this image. Does God need to know where Adam is? It's for Adam that he asks, Adam, where are you? He hopes that Adam will come to his senses like the prodigal son did when the prodigal son realized, wait, I'm feeding pigs. I need to go home. The prodigal son figured out where he was and knew he needed to make a change. God says, Adam, where are you? Do you see where you are? And Adam responds, sadly, uh, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. What's wrong with this answer? Well, it's a half truth, isn't it? It's true that he knew that he was naked. It's true that he was afraid. But like the serpent, he's already telling half-truths. He doesn't mention the tree at all. He's rewriting history to suit himself, to self-justify. Relational breakdown even further with God. I can't tell God the whole truth. I'm not gonna tell God the whole truth. Maybe if I put this out here, he'll ignore this. Did you guys ever watch that show Cops? It's like on forever, <laughs> on the weirdest channels at the weirdest times. <laughs> Did you ever notice that uh, people would get caught with drugs and they'd show the cop, well, I I've, got, I've got this much on me when they had this much hiding in the house. <laughs> if I show you this, maybe you won't see that. It's deceptive. It's a break in relationship. The next break happens at the next moment. God gives him another chance. Okay, so you're naked, you think you're naked. Who told you that you were naked? He asks him straight out, have you eaten of the tree which I told you, commanded you not to eat? Just come clean, right? God already knows, come clean. And what's Adam's response? Don't you love this? Uh, that woman you gave me, she did it. She gave, it's, it's her fault. Doesn't that make you angry? <laughs> what if you were Eve in this moment? How would you feel, my friend Debbie says this, how would you feel as Eve, if, at, standing there as Eve, watching Adam throw you under the bus? Right? Adam blames, exactly. Adam, <laughs> Adam blames Eve, and did you notice this? Blames God as well. The woman that you gave me, he chooses to damage his personal relationships with God and Eve for self-preservation. I don't care about you guys, it's all on you, it's not mine. Wow. If there wasn't a break before with the covering and the, and the covering up from their shame, there is definitely a break between Adam and Eve now. There is no trust anymore, because right when it mattered most, I don't have your back. He didn't before when he let her eat from the fruit, but he really doesn't have it now. So God, still with patience, seriously, at what point would you have just lost your temper <laughs> in all of this if you were God, right? I'm like, I'm amazed that God is like, okay, Eve, what is this that you have done? Let's see if you can get it right. Let's see if you can come clean. Eve gets closer, but not quite. What does she say? The serpent deceived me and I ate. Well, at least she admitted she ate of the fruit, but it's the serpent's fault. She blames a creature under her authority. 
So now there's a break between humans and creation. It's all messed up. You know, he gave them a chance to try and repair their relationship with him. Isn't that interesting? We think, boom, fall over. And that is what happened. But it's interesting that God kept saying, come on, what did you do? Come and talk to me, come back to me. But neither of them, neither of them acknowledged, apologized. Did you notice that? There was no, hey, sorry God, my bad, right? They didn't repent. They didn't do anything to repair their relationship with God. They were completely trying to take care of themselves. Self-interested, self-focused. The relational order is completely out of whack. So I ask you, back to that relationship that I asked you to think about at the very beginning. In this breakdown of this relationship and the t difficulty you're having, did you or the other person hide some sort of a wrong that was done? Whether it's conscious or unconscious, right? Did you or the other person try to avoid one another? That's a great tactic, right? How about anybody lie or tell a half truth or justify your actions by reconstructing history? Well, from my point of view, this is what happened. How about blame? Anybody blame the other person or did the other person blame you or somebody else or circumstances? Hey, I, I only did this because of X, Y, and Z. Can I answer this question for you? Of course you did. You did, they did, somebody sinned. That's how relationships break down. You are living in the effects of the fall. This is our go-to posture in everything. We see trouble, we self-protect. So, let's recap the big relational effects of the fall. We feel shame about who we are. There's something wrong with us. That's that moment, right? Where we try and cover up. We, get this, created things that we were supposed to have authority over now have control over us. You ever heard of addictions? Heck, just idolatry, that's what that is. We feel isolated from other people. We are wary and we're fearful of being hurt. Why wouldn't we be? Because, likewise, we're into self-protection and therefore we will hurt others. <laughs> we're afraid of getting hurt because we get hurt and we hurt other people. When we feel guilty, what do we do with God? We hide, we avoid, we blame, we run away. We do all these things to get away from God. We live for ourselves. This is the main part of the fall. We live for ourselves outside of this beautiful order that was meant for us under God, over creation, in open relationship, cooperative relationship with one another. We live outside of it, we live totally for ourselves. I was so grateful that they invited me to talk about the fall. I said, yay, I get to talk about such good news. <laughs> right, it's a little depressing, right? Yeah? But doesn't it feel somehow real that I'm talking about it? Doesn't it feel like your life in some area? Nothing's perfect, nothing's the way it should be and we long for it to be the way it should be. So life after Eden. Check out this amazing painting. This is a painting in Italy as they're being banished from the Garden of Eden. Ugh. Right? This is life outside of Eden. And Paul summed it up in Romans like this. None is righteous, no, not one. He's pulling from Psalms and Proverbs when he put this collection together. 
No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. Read this. The venom of asps is under their lips. Right? Like from the serpent, right? Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood and their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. And the worst part of all, there is now no fear of God before their eyes. That, those are the relational effects of the fall. So of course, is there any hope from us? Or as Paul says, who will rescue me from this body of death? Here's an interesting thought. Did you know there's only one person who's ever lived who was absolutely perfect in his relationships with God, with others, with creation, and with himself. I know it's the Sunday school answer, but it is the answer. We need Jesus. He's the only one that knows how to do this, you guys. He's the only one who knows how to live a life full of love for God and love for others. He's the only one who ever did it right. So, what can you do? You can admit that you are relationally broken and ask Jesus to reconnect you to God through the Holy Spirit. If you've never done it the first time, that's crucial because you are separated from God. And only Jesus, only the Holy Spirit can reconnect you in relationship to him. You can intentionally spend time in your relationship with Jesus. Bring him into all parts of your life. All parts of your life, because every aspect of your life is about a relationship. You can follow Jesus as Lord. We talk about following Jesus as Lord, but have you ever thought about this? Following him as Lord in how to be good at relationships. Huh? Isn't that interesting? He can teach us, he can teach us how to do our relationships well. And when you screw up, and you're gonna screw up, because we all do, you come back to God in relationship. You do what Adam and Eve didn't do. You, You confess, you make it clean, you say, yeah, I did it. And ask him to help you. It's simple, right? But it's oh so hard. Because Jesus, because of Jesus, I love this, this is, sums up our new life. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself from that initial break and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. It's all about relationship, you guys. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world, even creation to himself, right? And not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us again this message of reconciliation. It's about coming back. So one last time, think about that relationship. Would you do that for me? That broken relationship and ask God Is there some wrong that you need to confess to him and to the other person in this relationship? Even if it's their fault, sometimes you've got a part in it, by the way. Ask him how he sees and is involved in this broken relationship. How might God's perspective on your relationship with this person affect this broken relationship? What does he see? And if Jesus will show you how to best love this person. Let's pray. Father God, we don't know how to do this. We are hardwired to do relationship poorly, to take care of ourselves first and foremost, and forget you and forget others. We forget how to love. We need you. Call us back to you. Give us practical steps in how to grow in love for you and for others. We thank you for this day and this week and for the relationships you give us. 
And we thank you that you continue to reach out to us in relationship time and time again, no matter how much we screw up. We love you, Lord. Help us to grow in love with you. We pray this in the name of the one who connects us to you in relationship, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You are dismissed. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.